my favorite, literally my favorite, another interrupting dinner type thing with my wife was you Darvish DMing me about Shane Bieber's knuckle curve grip. And I'm getting this DM while I'm sitting at dinner again and my poor wife. Um, but I'm like seeing my phone and she's like, get off your phone. I'm like, but you Darvish is DMing me to find a grip for him. And I'm like, I gotta do it. Like it's one of those things like, I have to do it right now. Hey everybody, it is Justin Shackle welcoming you to episode 18 of Toe in the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn, where we look to deep dive into the art of pitching each and every show. We do it with the Cy Young Award winner, the five-time World Series champ, David Cohn, the research ace, James Smythe, and myself. And this week, we get to talk to one of the best content creators on the internet when it comes to baseball. And David, you have referenced this person so many times over the years on Yankee broadcast, but now you get to talk to Pitching Ninja on your pitching podcast. Pretty cool. Yeah, you know, um, Rob Friedman is the Pitching Ninja, and he's a remarkable guy with a remarkable story, you know, and we talk to him, and he does not disappoint because he's just so real. There's something real about him that players have responded to over the years, and that's why he's become such a favorite of, Really, anybody out there, whether you're, whether you're a major league pitcher or a college uh, pitcher or even a, a kid in high school or amateur law that wants to get seen, his flat ground app that he helped create is helping kids get scholarships. It's helping them continue their careers. It's, it's really from the ground up uh, is, is what he's created here. And, you know, there, you know I, I use the word authentic. He, he's an authentic dude. He really is. And just talking to him, it just comes out. It comes out of him and that's why he's so popular. That's why players have responded to him the way they have, because uh, they love this guy and they love what he's doing out there. If you're unfamiliar with Pitching Ninja, just a, a quick synopsis here. The guy's name is Rob Friedman. He's from Georgia. He's a 55-year-old lawyer, and he now works as an analyst for ESPN and, and Major League Baseball when it comes to pitching analysis videos. He creates pitching analysis videos and GIFs on social media, has over half a million followers on all his platforms. He's he's creating this stuff and it's so high quality and detailed that big league pitchers are going to him for video analysis. And you're going to hear some of those cool stories of him interacting with big leaguers on the internet and kind of having him get in contact and, and them reaching out, trying to find some tips through video analysis. It's fascinating. But David, you also brought up another leg of what Rob is all about. That's the flat ground accounts. And like you said, that focuses on players getting scouted and becoming marketable through their own actions and kind of recruited and doing it through video, through social media. And look, that's just the way this world is working right in, in 2022. It's now entered the baseball space. If you're not selling yourself, you're doing it wrong, right? Well, it's true. I mean, you can buy a car online. You can buy a house online now, sight unseen. So now you can get a scholarship online or a chance to play college baseball or maybe even high school baseball if you're even younger than that. I mean, all you have to do, and you'll get the information from Rob himself in this episode, but take a video of you at your best tweet it to flat grant flat ground app and they'll do the work for you. They'll put it out there. And there's a lot of coaches, a lot of scouts, a lot of people looking for talent that go to that source. And it's, it's a great way for you to, to get seen, to get exposure and get to the next level, whatever that next level is for you, whether you're trying to get to high school baseball, trying to get to college baseball, or you're a professional trying to get signed in the off season. There's examples, a lot of examples of all three of those things happening and happening right now in real time as we speak. Yeah, David, I know you're a big fan. You've mentioned him on broadcast. You've gone out of your way to do that. And James, I know you're a big fan too. And I, you know, I didn't, I wanted to kind of surprise you with this question. Like what is your favorite piece of pitching ninja content? Is there that one gift that always stands out to you when people bring up his name and his work? Which one is it? Do you have it? A good question. Uh, it probably changes by the week, uh, <laughs> but uh, how can you not love anything regarding Jacob Degrom? I, I just that one just thought I thought of that because uh, he had a couple of uh, Degrom themed uh, posts uh, the other day. So I was thinking, and just over and over again, just perfect precision painting the corners, 
great fastball. He could locate it off speed or whatever you call off speed from Jacob Dugram. It just, they, and the way he puts it all together, just really fantastic. And, uh, and that's, that's one coming to mind right away. But if you ask me again next week, maybe it's something else. He's, he's, he's an educator, you know, I mean, he did a, he did a spot the other day on Burt Blylevin's curveballs where it was just, just a curveball after curveball, but like one of the best curveballs I've ever seen. Burt Blylevin, you know, some people might not even have heard of him that are, that are of a younger age, but he's in the hall of fame, had a long career and arguably the best or one of the five best at a minimum curveballs, true curveballs in the history of the game. He rode that curveball all the way to the Hall of Fame, and Pitching Ninja had a special on him the other day. And if you've never heard of or seen Bird Bly 11, it was a great little feature that you could watch in under a minute and see maybe a dozen or 15 of Bird Bly 11's best curveballs against major league hit- hitters. Really? Yeah, what on you too? Involving swords. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we've, we, we can get into some of his own terminology, right, guys? I mean, he's created certain pitching terms, which is important. Uh, it, very impressive. But David, yeah, he came up with a video of you too. Don't sell yourself self short. Look, that's not the reason why we have him on here. We're not reciprocating, but he, he did a, a quick deep dive on, on your career as well and what you were all about on the mound. But we get into a lot of really good topics with Rob, how to make yourself marketable as a young pitcher how he's kind of continuing to evolve around some of the new technology that's out there. I thought that was really interesting. So we have a really good conversation with the Ninja. We're we're also going to look at some of what has happened with the labor talks between the league and the players association. And maybe why there, you know, could be a deal sooner rather than later. We'll uh, we'll go through this week in pitching history, three up, three down before we get to the opener, David quickly, your Kansas city chiefs, losing the AFC title game at home on Sunday against Joe Burrow and the Bengals after being up at one point, 21 to three on Cincinnati. How are you holding up, my friend? That was a tough one. You know, you really felt like with Patrick Mahomes at home with a lead that you had pretty good, you had a pretty good chance there to close that one out. Uh, you know, the Chiefs have had an unbelievable run, four straight championship games at Arrowhead in Kansas City. Uh, they've only got one Super Bowl championship. It just felt like the Bengals had their number. They beat them earlier in the year. Uh, they matched up well, personnel-wise. Two great young quarterbacks. Joe Burrow, that's cementing his legend early in his career. He's a pretty impressive young player. And Cincinnati's got some good – they've got uh, a good team. And, and uh, they just seem to match up with the Chiefs very well this year. And beating them twice towards the end of the year. I mean, uh, obviously the, the playoff game, the championship game, and then earlier in the year, not long ago, they beat them as well and came back with a big second half to beat them. So it seemed like they were matched up pretty well personnel-wise with the Chiefs. Yeah, James, I, your tweets during football games, they stick out because you, you obviously do a, a terrific job during baseball games, but I think football is like your second strongest sport in terms of some of the the deep dives that you go down with, through NFL history and stuff because like baseball – NFL history is rich. It goes back. There are a lot of great names and, and players and personalities that go back with its history. You do a great job of finding those nuggets in real time as the games are going on. What did you find interesting about this championship weekend? Uh, thank you, first of all. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, no, it was, uh, it was just so jarring to see KC dominate uh, in the first half. And then to see Cincy come all the way back like that, it was uh, people say stunning or unbelievable uh, a lot. And it's kind of overused in sports. It was truly stunning to see the turnaround from the first half to the second half uh, in that game. And um, one thing that jumps out to me, uh, both quarterbacks uh, in the Super Bowl, Joe Burrow and Matt Stafford are going to wear number nine. So it's the uh, it's going to be the fourth Super Bowl with both QBs having the same uniform number. Very yeah. interesting. Terry Bradshaw and Roger Staubach met twice wearing number 12. And then the first one was another pair of 12s with Staubach and, uh, and Bob Greasy. So now we'll, we'll get all these years later, we'll, we'll get it back. But it was just a big surprise with, with KC and um, Tyreek Hill had a big first half. He didn't get a touch or a target from about the 13 minute mark in the third quarter until the interception in overtime. Didn't touch the ball and wasn't even targeted. So it's very, uh, very surprising. 
Yeah, there were so many things at certain moments in that game that make you scratch your head, and that's one of them. The the juxtaposition between halves for Tyree Kill and then the the play calling at the end of the first half and at the end of the game for Kansas City kind of make you you scratch your head a little bit there too. And in in that last drive right before overtime, I'm thinking, man, Mahomes feels like he's you know, he's getting a little too greedy with trying to keep the play alive and try and make things happen. Obviously, he's an extraordinary talent, but just the way that last drive was going, there were a couple of plays, obviously the sack, it just felt like things could have been a little bit, it was uncharacteristic of what the Chiefs had been doing, which you kind of come to expect in those types of situations from a team like that. The play calling, I think that's going to be really tough to sit on. Uh, through the off season for that group. It's a great point. You know, he scrambled a lot. There was that yeah. one play where he scrambled, like it seemed like forever and then got maybe four yards. He went right. He went left. He circled around, scrambled down the line, got four yards. And after that, he looked kind of gassed to me. Like he was out of right. gas a little bit, like from all that scrambling kind of took a little bit out of him. You know, easy, easy for us to say watching, but, but it kind of looked that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that was, that's a good term to just label the the, the late fourth quarter Maybe some of the things late first half, it was uncharacteristic of the Chiefs. It was interesting, but it's about how you uh, how you respond there. So obviously they have the talent to to come back and make a big bang in 2022 later on next season. Um, all right. The opener here, David. Lots to discuss based on what has transpired over the last week between the league and the Players Association, correct? Yes, uh, there is. You know, we've said all along that the, the framework is there for a deal. It's not like they're talking apples and oranges, so to speak. And you know, they, they're, they're kind of speaking the same language. You, you can see where the players are going with this and concentrated on the younger players. That's why they gave up their request for the back end of free agency going from six, in, six years to five years. They, they dropped that one. That was kind of a no-go zone for the owners. But you can see they're, they're narrowing their focus to where they need to be, whether it's a, some sort of new pool uh, payment arrangement for some of the players that are younger and then in their pre-arbitration years. So the ideas are kind of circling around there, what kind of formula can be designed. Uh, uh, rather than going from three years to two years on arbitration, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they, how they come up with a solution in that particular area and then the minimum wage and Maybe around the international draft a little bit, but uh, the core economic issues are kind of there for the taking. You need some creative minds. You need some compromise now to get to the last stage of of actually making a deal, getting an agreement done. Uh, It seems like they're trending in that direction. If there are people in baseball circles they speak to in the last week or so, they feel like there are obviously still significant hurdles to leap over but the path is there the path is more there now than it probably was since the start of the lockout so it's a very positive sign and look you have three meetings in one week i you know you kind of have to search for improvements and progress and all that stuff based on what we had right six weeks of dead silence Uh, i think a lot has happened here in in this past week and where do you think the players could still gain a lot of ground in the negotiations. Is it with that arbitration pool? Is that the most significant? Is there something else? Yeah, I think the combination, the one-two punch to counter the service time manipulation, you know, and that's still going on. It's hard to, it's hard to come up with a formula to counter, you know, play, you know, like a, a top prospect, an Adley Rushman for the Baltimore Orioles who's clearly ready for the major leagues. Will he start out in the major leagues this year or will they hold him back to, to manipulate his service time another year? There's still going to be that going on. So obviously to counter that, you need something with the arbitration years. You need some sort of pool of resources that, that allows the players to get more money going that way earlier in their career. And, and also, you know, you, you, you need players to feel like you know, that you're making progress. If this is something that the, that the player reps can take back to, to, to the constituents, contingency and say, you know, hey, how do we interpret this? How do we make progress? This is something we can hang our hat on. This new formula, this new idea is something that we really feel like it's worthwhile and it gets us trending in the right direction. I think that's, that's the part. It's the interpretation between 
the executive subcommittee, the players that, that are, uh, you know, the American League and National League rep, when they go back to their individual teams and the player reps for each individual team, sends that message back that you're clear in your messaging, that you feel like, you know, you've made progress here and this is worth worthwhile to consider. I'm not sure they're there yet, but it feels like they, they're getting closer to there. And, and, and obviously a big bump in the minimum wage would help as well uh, to get some of the younger players paid more sooner in their careers. And that will help out the veteran players at the end of their careers as well, because you know it, it, it helps them if there's not you know a, a rookie that's that can be paid minimum wage that's going to take your job. If it's more equitable on the on the beginning of your career, then that that's going to help out the veteran players as well. That fourth or fifth outfielder that, that can't find a job because it's cheaper to pay a rookie, you know, or somebody right out of you know right out of the minor leagues. That's what I'm wondering about because all right, we are now not going to have free agency move from year six to year five. Okay. Uh, but also the league doesn't want to touch the current arbitration eligibility of three years. Okay. So that's off limits. I think in, in lieu of a uh, salary floor or something like that, raising the minimum salary would also help boost the payroll of all these lower payroll clubs anyway. So raise that up. And a new CBA is really the only bite of the apple that the players get to get a big bump in the minimum salary. If you look at it's, if you look at a graph of the minimum salary, it's really kind of like a step ladder. It jumps up with the new CBA and then it levels off until the next CBA. And then only then does it increase. So the league putting forth a proposal that was initially uh, saying, all right, we'll raise it 5%. Now it's six or 7%. The players want a 36% increase, which sounds outlandish, but the average increase in the minimum salary in a new CBA historically is around 29%. So which, which side is closer to the norm? Now, maybe 36 is a little too steep, but it's certainly a lot closer to normal than you know, what the league is proposing. And I think that's somewhere where if we, the whole idea is to get the younger players paid sooner or to shift money closer towards the younger players, and that's a good way to do it. I'm with you, man. I think if you start to see a sizable year by year increase within the CBA, not just at the very start. I, th I think if, if that is kind of laid down as some of the framework toward that, you know, core economic issue, I think it makes things a lot easier. I think raising the minimum salary, getting it up closer. I mean, right now it's just under 700,000. I, I think if you're able to raise it, uh, sound, you know, just sounding very casually coming out of me. If you're able to raise it a couple hundred thousand, yeah. you know, I, th I think it'll go a long way. But I think the important part is the year by year increase outside of the CBA year. So it'd be 2022, the years following, the four years, five years following that, if it, there is a sizable increase and not just that 1%, 2% tick up, I think that will go a long way in satisfying the players union. That's just me. You know, the, I think the point being is that arbitration in and of itself just allows a player to get a halfway decent or at least a fair salary. You know, without arbitration, you could win an MVP uh, award in your rookie year. You can win an MVP award in your second year. You're going to make pretty close to that minimum wage, whatever it is. And the players are stuck at the owner's mercy before they have any rights to go to arbitration. And if you see, if you see it, you know, look at Aaron Judge's progressive salaries over the years from his first couple of years before he was arbitration eligible. And he had an MVP year in there in, in those years. And, you know, it, it's just it's a there's a sense of fairness. I think that the players seek in those early years uh, as opposed to just being at the mercy of the owners. And I know, hey, my, my father worked in a meat packing plant. He made thirty thousand dollars a year. So I get it. When you're talking about five hundred thousand or seven hundred fifty thousand, it's a lot of money. But when you're talking about the entertainment business and you're talking about a sense of fairness, that's what the players are searching for right here earlier in their career, just a sense of fairness and not be stuck at the owner's mercy in terms of, well, yeah, we can give you a $50,000 raise. You just had an MVP year, but you know what? We don't have to if we don't want to. And that's kind of the way it is, the way it is now for the players before they get to arbitration, which could be the first three years of your career. It's a lot of surplus value for some of the best players in the league during those first three years. We'll see what happens the last week, though. Three meetings, 
obviously a variety of issues were addressed or they were actually, you know, at least discussed, touched on, whether it be core economics or outside of the core economics, all good signs compared to what we had prior to last week and more talk should be coming up here shortly. So we'll look forward to that. Hopefully they continue to uh, push the gas pedal toward that progress because time's wasting guys. I mean, we're in February now, the scheduled start of spring training, only a couple of weeks away. This is the time where we're going to start seeing whether or not the calendar becomes an issue with these, with these negotiations. All right, let's get to pitching ninja. Um, Obviously, like we said at the top, a fabulous content creator here on the baseball space in this industry, uh, dynamite job as a pitching ninja offering terrific analysis and the flat ground app, something that we touch on as well. It's a great tool for young players. One of the best content creators in the sport of baseball, Rob Friedman, the pitching ninja here on toe in the slab pitching with David Cohn. Rob ninja. Welcome to the podcast. We just talked about this moments before we started. I asked you like, what, what are, you being called these days from people outside of the baseball world, but in real life. And I'm sure there are a couple of people that cross the, the line between both worlds. What, what are you hearing more often these days? What should we be calling you? Is it Rob? Is it Ninja? Is it pitching Ninja? What, what do you have here? Uh, you can call me any, like it really varies. Like I try not to talk to anybody outside of baseball for one. So, um, but uh, Rob, Ninja, either one is cool with me. Okay. Well, I'm going to go with Rob. David, I have, I don't know if you, you've noticed this. James, I don't know if you've noticed this either, but I'm not like, I'm not the biggest nickname person. And people have had a ton of nicknames for me throughout my life. But like, what David, are they? I, I rarely call. So my last name is Shackle. So, I mean, I've had every variation of every Shaquille O'Neal nickname being called. So the most common one is Shaq, but you have Shaq in a Fool. Shaky Shack, um, I mean Shack Daddy. There, there are a ton. Like David, I don't. I rarely call you Coney. I'm just not a big. It's just me. I know it's a. It's a thing that I guess I have with myself. I don't use nicknames so much. So Rob, I'm gonna. I'm going with Rob. You can totally da- do that. David James. I go like with Roy, whatever. I you like want. Roy from Ted, Ted Lasso. Actually, yeah. doesn't look like Roy from Ted Lasso. <laughs> I have gotten that more times than I would ever have suspected. I love the show, so I'm a big fan. Yes. And I, I love just did. Yeah, first time I saw him go off, I'm thinking that. I'm like, I wonder if Ninja acts like that in, in his basement. If something's going wrong with this, <laughs> you know, if he starts cursing, you know, and dropping F bombs, I mean, I'm just wondering what, what he's really like behind the scenes. Little known fact, I absolutely do. I <laughs> so, do. Yes. So I, I knew there was a link there between you. Yeah, no, I absolutely. All right, Rob, it's late January now. What do you need to do to pre- prepare for a season? Like, what's life like now, obviously, compared to a day during April? So, really, in the off season, I work on my weighted keyboard to try to get my fingers in shape. You know, That's it's smart. just about the process. I try to, you know, prove a little bit every day, hit the weight room because the season's long and grueling. No, I'd like, I never have an off season. I keep doing stuff. So, Really, it's trying different things in the off season. I like see what works and what doesn't work. I always try to up my game and show things differently. But I really like to focus more on the old school baseball that I don't get to do during the during the season. So that's kind of what I do in the off season. Yeah, I think it's great. You know that the way you've evolved. I know we'll get into the beginnings and you know how you got started. Some of the the troubles you ran into with Major League Baseball along the way. I know one of our former guests has a question for you. I think then, you know, Shaq is going to get that to you and feed that to you as one of the features on our podcast. But for me, the flat ground app, the thing you, what you're doing with amateur players now, I, I refer them to you. I mean, if I get a kid from Jersey that says, Hey, what can I do? I'm 16. You know, how do I grip my curveball? Hey, I want to get to college. Go to flat ground app. You know, have you heard of the pitching ninja? Have you heard of Rob Friedman? You know, to me, that's one of the most exciting things you have working right now. It, it is one of my favorite things too, because it's, it's part of my goal. Like the reason I literally started this whole thing and we can get into it now or get into it later, but I started the whole pitching ninja stuff really as a coach, trying to share what I had learned from some of the great people that were nice enough to give me their time. And I figured that I wasn't going to coach forever. So I, I, I might as well pass it down. Why should I keep all this information rather than like share it with everybody. So kids that can't afford good instruction can 
can see this stuff. They can see pitch grips. They can see mechanics. Um, but then the whole recruiting side. So my son, uh, you know, did the whole travel ball cir circuit showcase circuit, ended up going to Georgia tech. And we had a lot of parents that, I mean, you know what it's like they, you, as a parent, you never want your kid to miss out on anything. So you spend a lot of money and it's less living your life through them. Some of these people just want their kid to be happy. And they spend a lot on showcases, a lot on travel teams. And you go to a showcase and say, you're not your best, you know, say you're, or you, or you're in a geographic area that doesn't get a lot of looks. I was like, there's gotta be something that breaks this down that helps people be seen. And that's how I started, um, flat ground. Really the purpose is totally free. Let kids be seen. You can never complain that I would have been somebody if scouts would have seen me. Now there's really not an excuse. You're going to be seen. And uh, then it's up to you. And that was like, that is my goal is like to, to just grow the game. The more, I don't think baseball should ever be a rich kid sport. I don't think it should be, you should be excluded because you don't have money or your parents don't have money. And in, in other areas and other countries, it's not. And in our country, it's about like how much you can spend on coaches and showcases and all that and fancy uniforms and gloves and bats. So I wanted yeah. to help. Private lessons, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just wanted to help. Can you just give us the mechanics again? There's an app that kids can, if a kid asks me today, what, what, I, what can I do? Tell them exactly. I mean, I know you create, help create that app. Yeah. So basically just shoot a video. And if you tweet it to flat ground, it's, it's very simple. Just tweet it to flat ground app for pitchers, flat ground bats for hitters. I end up retweeting. I do all the retweeting right now. I wish I wasn't, but I do. And I look at the, making sure they have, you know, you want your velo in there if you're a pitcher and you want any, any information you have, what, you, what you're looking for as a hitter stats or, or any metrics that you can share are useful, but different views of your swing, market yourself, use, use as much information as you can in the tweet and you'll be seen. We've signed, I mean, I would say, a thousand i don't even know the number like colleges and then mlb teams like how sick is this mlb teams pick up folks from flat ground and i never thought that was going to happen but i've had like 40 guys get get spots with with major league organizations through flat ground rob what has the feedback been like from those major league teams what have the executives actually said to you about the app and not just major league teams, colleges as well, coaches from the college circuit. So they love it. And you, that's the thing I wasn't sure of, right? You have scouts and stuff. Am I stepping on their toes? No, I'm actually helping them find, uncover things so they don't get in trouble or they're able to find something before other folks do. If you work hard and you're a scout and you scour this stuff, you can find people. Um, colleges, a lot of coaches will say, one, it means more time with their family. They can look at, they don't have to be out at a field all the time. They can actually look at their feed. The other thing that's really cool is like no college has a budget to recruit overseas, right? I mean, they barely have budgets. College baseball is not a huge sport except for the top tier programs. So I'm, I've had people from Japan, from the Netherlands get found on flat ground and then get, get offered like JUCO uh, spots or, or D one spots because they were just made available. And then a coach said, well, you know, if you're ever in the States, stop on by. Um, so they don't have to, nobody's going to fly to Japan to scout players. They're just not, but if they see them and they say, Hey, I'm throwing 88 and I'm six, four, you know, are you interested For, very first guy that I did from the Netherlands had 29 offers. He was six, four throwing 88. I'm like 17 year old kid. And people like colleges were just like, without even meeting him, we're sending him stuff. So I thought that was really cool. I want to spend a little bit more time on this area because I think it's so important. Like, guys, we, we talked to a lot of big leaguers so far on this podcast. They're not really entrenched in the, the amateur, the showcase circuit for, for someone who, you mean, you just had a, a son go through that route on his way to Georgia Tech. Your son's a right-hander now at at. Georgia Tech, he was one of the highly ranked right-handers in the state of Georgia, did the perfect game, did the showcases. With an app like this, I thought it was such like a great idea when I first learned about it because to me, it just keeps scouting up at the times. It's just keeping it with the way the world's working right now. But with the showcases and trying to get looked at by colleges, is there something like if, if there's a parent out there here that's possibly looking for different ways to get their kid that best 
kind of exposure as, as much as they possibly can, no matter what dense area they're from, what would your advice be for them as a parent who kind of just went through it recently? I would say as a parent, showcases, all that stuff's important. Everything's important. You want your kid to get as much experience as you can. Um, but the, the cool thing about flat ground, you can put yourself up there as many times you want, get feedback, change things. Um, so I'll give you, my, my kid went to a showcase. We went to, I think it was in Nashville and he ended up with a stomach bug. And, you know, we did, we all took off work. We went there and, and, uh, and, and, and went out there and he just wasn't at his best that game. And you're watching all the guys behind home plate. They put their radar guns down kind of depressing feeling when you're a pitcher and they're like that. Um, but he didn't want to tell anybody he was sick, but if, if I like, I could afford that. If other parents that are, you know, they, they don't have a great job. They're not, they, they have to beg for time off, make it up some other time. And then their kids sick. Like that's brutal. You're now flushing money down the toilet. You're flushing travel, hotel, food, the amount of the cost for the showcase. Um, it's, it's painful. And with flat ground, it supplements all that. Nothing's ever going to replace a coach watching the player. Um, but you can know which players to watch and you can showcase yourself at your very best because in the end, a coach, most coaches think that they can get you up near that best anyway. Um, so they want to see what you can do at your best. And this is a way of doing it. So, but I think it's a multi-pronged approach. I think you need to have everything. All right. So we wanted to kind of go in order there, but we, I think we got one of the more important topics out of the way first, because it deals with how as a youth, you can really market yourself and discover yourself in today's world and how that intersects with the sport of baseball. So bravo to you, Rob, on that. But in the beginning, I mean, this maybe seven years ago when you started making this kind of content, there were some obstacles along the way. I think now you have over 600,000 followers on all your social media accounts. And I never it's, counted that. It's got, I did it for you there. So thank you doing the heavy work, but you've gotten this to a point where you literally have big leaguers coming to you, seeking video analysis, seeking advice through that way on how they can improve one of those pitchers that I guess you caught his attention with the work you did. And this is something that David alluded to earlier. We had Josiah Gray on the podcast last week, and we do this kind of cool feature that we just started. Every guest that comes on the podcast, we end it by giving that guest the chance to ask something of an upcoming guest on this podcast. So we usually save it for the end here, but we're going to give you your question from Josiah Gray now, because it kind of fits the timeline of your work here. So this again comes from, from 24 year old Josiah Gray, dynamite right-handed pitcher of the nationals. Here is what he asked you on our last episode of toe in the slab. <laughs> I have a funny one. So uh, when he got banned by Twitter uh, back when I was in college, what was going through his mind? Why did it happen? How did it happen? sort of just, I guess, talk through it and like, how did, uh, how did he transition? Because, you know, he was, he was still in the up and up, but he wasn't what he is today. So I guess just take us through, you know, that Twitter ban, even though he was pumping out the best content and, uh, you know, kind of just talk us through it and, and give us his take on it. Absolutely. Should I shoot it now? I got it. <laughs> uh, so I had been, I had mentioned I'd started mostly as a, as a coach trying to share information. So all my gifts and everything were really focused on like breaking down mechanics at that point, maybe showing some overlays, I think. Um, but really coming at it as a way of education. And one time I, it was a, I, I remember the pitch because I actually just retweeted it recently too. It was a Noah Syndergaard ridiculous, like it was an incredible sinker i think i called it like this black magic sinker that moved it was windy it moved like it, it ran like 22 inches and it was just insane i'd never it was like throwing a ball in a tornado um so i had tweeted it out there and then somebody else retweeted it but then took the the video themselves and tweeted it out there um and i said hey you, you know you should like just retweet it or give me credit do something it ended up 
they got their, there were a bunch of followers that saw that. And they ended up saying that, uh, I think they contacted MLB maybe and said pitching ninjas claiming this content and MLB then contacted Twitter, um, Twitter then shut my account down, which I didn't know until the middle of the night, this was kind of funny. Like I'm sitting there, I went, sometimes I have a hard time sleeping because I'm thinking of what content to come up with like it's weird um a really big add and i make up like in the middle of the night i'll say i'm going to tweet this tomorrow and i just do um so i went downstairs checked my phone and my phone was blowing up like i had never seen that many texts and messages and all that and i realized that my account got shut down and i just went back to sleep because my thought my thought was twofold my, it was either i am never going to get back on online and they're just going to ban me. And I'm like, see, I don't care. I have more time in my day. Now I was trying to do a good thing and grow the sport and help people. But if they don't want the help, that's fine. Or MLB is going to realize that I'm doing a, doing them a service. And really I always considered the use of what I was doing fair use, which is basically taking content, trying to teach through it, but not like showing large portions of a game or something like that. I totally get MLB owns the, the copyrights. Um, but there are exceptions to copyright law if you're using it to help instruct people. So being a lawyer, boo, um, I, I kind of knew my rights in this stuff, but I also knew that I wasn't really going to fight it too much. It ended up, so it, it this went on for like a week. And I think Jeff Passan wrote an article. He ended up talking to MLB during the process of writing this article. And they said, uh, oh no, we love what he does. We're going to work something out. So that ended up being it. Like they worked out a, a mutually agreeable thing with me because they said they need this to grow. They need people like y'all. They need people like, you know, everybody on John boy's crew, every like foolish baseball. You need a whole bunch of people with different views of the game and nobody is subtracting views from the game. Like your, your stuff, uh, my stuff, it makes people want to watch the game. So I think they get it. They know they need those folks, but there's a tension between copyright law and, uh, and them enforcing their rights while also growing the game. And I think they're trying, everybody's trying to strike that right balance, but none of us are here rebroadcasting the game and showing and saying, you can get us from us instead of, you know, whatever MLB, it's just not a, not a thing. So that once that was resolved, it was like, oh my God, this is so cool. I can do anything I want as long as it's promoting the game and you know, not doing stuff that would they'd be unhappy with. So I did that and it, it actually helped me grow. And and Jojo's exactly right that that was a big boost to what I was doing because it made me feel better about it. Like I never wanted to be the dude in the shadows, like, oh my God, I hope LB doesn't catch me. So that's hopefully a short, relatively short story about it. I, I think so many people from what was that like 2017, 2018 around yeah, then? something like that. I think like if you were starting to make content today around major league baseball games, it wouldn't be as hard as it was four, five, six years ago. Right. I, I fought, I fought for everybody's rights. <laughs> I mean, that, it was actually, it's kind of cool. Like that, that part, like being the OG Trailblazer. You know, yeah. You trailblazer. Yeah, you blaze like, a new trail. Yeah. Right. And it could have gone the other way. Like if they, if MLB wanted to, they could have said, you know what? We well, you don't, know, sorry, eh, you're not doing it. It was awesome of them. It was the right time. It was awesome of, the, of them to recognize it. And uh, kudos. Like I think MLB gets a lot of people crapping on them just because it's fun to do. This was an area where I thought they did a really good job. And they, I think it's helped the sport. The sport's getting more viewers now. Yeah. I think they're still improving too. I think David, they are too. James, when, when did you guys first have Rob stuff kind of pop on your radar? Can you remember? Not sure, but I feel like it was uh, pretty early on that, you know, the baseball Twitter world would, uh, would pass this or would pass this great stuff around and, uh, and then starting to follow Rob. It's just, it really opens your mind on how amazing pitching is. And, and just trying to wrap your head around all these, this great talent, both in the game today and like Rob has, has gotten into some historical stuff too in old clips. So it's really, it's really um, fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that, that Rob's been a part of the game here. And I'm glad that MLB has gone along with it because it's, 
it's not like you said, it's not uh, you're not live streaming an entire game to, to circumvent MLB broadcast rules. It's using clips and it's something that, you know, the NBA embraced very early on. I'm glad MLB is, you know, has come along in this in a similar fashion. That's a great point about the NBA and being progressive in, in, in the growth of the game. But for me, it was it was when I'm doing a Yes Network game and uh, producers and directors are asking me, yeah, how do we get this on air? How do we get the tails on the pitches that that Rob sort of uh, brought into the forefront? And, and to me, it was, you know, explaining to the average fan out there how hard it is to hit these pitches. Look at this movement. Look at how they all look the same up to a certain point right in front of home plate. When, when the hitter has to make a decision and then they break different ways. And, you know, that, that's something that, that I believed in for a long time. You know, Jack Curry and I did a book full count where I talked about X games, making pitches break right and left on both sides of the plate and being able to tunnel those pitches or come in on the same plane. And I think Rob was the first guy to kind of simplify it and show just with, with that. I don't know how you came up with, with uh, the technology, Rob, but you were ahead of the game in terms of showing the movement on the pitches with a tail on it. That, that is so easy to see and, and a quick gif or a, a quick, you know, tweet that, that, that you put out there. Yeah. You know, that's a, it's the way my mind works, I guess. Like I didn't, I like, that was something that maybe subliminally I'm influenced by something, but it's also coming at it fresh. Like there are people that live the game every day, grew up playing the game every day or play it, you know, coaching, whatever that they only know one way to teach stuff because they grew up in the game. And I didn't have that luxury of being a major league baseball player. So I had a, like, I, I, I get tired of people saying, why did he swing at that? Like I sit in the stands and, and somebody's yelling at a hitter going, Oh, they suck there. And to me, it was, it was just in my mind, like you have to understand what the hitters going through. They're way better than you are. If you're sitting in the stands, generally, um, there's a reason you're in the stands and they're playing, they make a lot of money. So there's more to it. And I thought that if I could help explain it, um, and I taught myself all that, like I am not a video guy by trade. I, I learned it all by doing, um, and just like, I keep learning, like I keep learning along the way. There are new things that I'm trying to do that help show this stuff. Um, but it just made sense to me because I I'm coming at it from a kind of different standpoint. Do you have anyone helping you? Are you still just doing all by yourself? I do have one just started working, helping me out. Um, a guy named Will Leahy, who has been great, like giving me a little bit of time to focus on what I like to do. And I'm actually launching, I'm not going to, I'll plug myself. I'm launching my merch stuff at, at uh, pitchingninja.com. Still working with Man Rotoware, but I needed to have a one stop shop for people to see stuff. And he's been helping with that. So freeing up my time to do what I like to do. Uh, but I, I still, every single tweet is my stuff. Always. It's, it's all me. When was the last time that you were in the stands at a major league baseball game? Shoot. That's a great question because I don't go very often. I mean, probably late, it's probably more at a college game than a, than a pro game because I mean, the all-star game, I mean, I was there. So I was, if that counts. Um, so that would be the last one. I like, I, the, and this is a problem of being pitching in here is when you go to a game, you're missing all the other games and including the game you're doing. So people rely on me to tweet during the game and the show, like, Oh my God, this happened. Oh my God, this happened. And I love it. But if I'm at a game, it is the most stressful thing in the world to be get you know, your phone blowing up about something that happened and I can't do anything about it. Um, that is painful. I think I was at a game during like Paxton's no hitter. Very frustrating for me. Um, I was at an anniversary, my anniversary dinner for, uh, what ended up being the sword of the year, uh, Miguel Castro's slider. I was at my dinner with my wife and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I gotta do this right now. So like, it's, uh, it's tough being me. Duty calls. Really. Yes, Yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. It's more important than everything. I love doing this stuff. You know, with, with, yeah, excuse me, Jason. Uh, with, with your son and, and, you know, going through, you know, the, sort of the continuing education from where you started to now seeing him progress through the college ranks and then, you know, what you've learned along the way. I mean, it's a baseball savant or, the, you know, the, the vertical and the horizontal movement, the Rapsodo machines, all the technology that's available, especially to your son. How much have you continued your education along the way? Oh, uh, like 
a ton. I reinvented everything that I do in my basement. And this is weird. I have a full, like I have a 60 foot, six inch mound set up with a rap Soto down there, a couple radar guns. Um, I still have people come over and I work with them for free. Cause I don't ever feel comfortable charging anything for anybody as I don't need the money from anybody. So I do it out of the goodness of my heart. I've had the uh, Georgia tech team down there during COVID practicing. Uh, so it's just fun. Like I love the new technology out there. I think it's a, it's a blast. And I've, the other thing that, so flat ground and pitching ninja stuff, I like, I am a geek when it comes to gear and stuff. Like I love all that. So I will buy everything. I have a Mark pro here. I have, you know, pocket radars, stalker, rap Soto. Um, yeah, I just like, I like buy everything to try it out. And I know I'm weird like that. So, but I can tell people like, this is the most important thing to get. If you are, you know, if you're at this stage, this is what I would do if I were you. Um, and this isn't what, like, there are other things that I've, I've gotten. And I'm like, I don't use this anymore because it's just not for me. And I, I do that. So other people don't have to spend their money and make stupid mistakes. I mean, I'm happy making mistakes for people, but yeah, I love all the gear and stuff. You mentioned the paranoia of missing something, right? It's a champagne problem to have at this point, which you've been able to develop. What is a typical weekday like for you during baseball season? Where are you situated? Are you moving around too much? Are your hands on the controls? What is it like for you from you know, the, the moment that the game start at, at 7 o'clock Eastern time till the final pitch of the night? Um, it is a lot of time sitting right where I am right here um, on my computer with some games running all over the place. Sometimes, I mean, I have a uh, laptop strategically placed other places. Like if I just want to get up and move because it's tough. I remember there was a, uh, it was Corbin Burns versus Barrios last year. It was one of the early games and I couldn't move for two hours because there was so much content, just that one game. I mean, it stood out to me like, like the, pitches were moving incredibly and it was so much fun to watch. And I really, you know, I can't even go to the bathroom. Like I need a bottle here or something to, to help out. But yeah, it's, it's like, it's like, like basically wall to wall, me sitting at a computer doing stuff. Um, and I wouldn't have it in any other way. It's so much fun. Like I just, I love the hands-on stuff and, and, and I love in season stuff, but I don't mind off season stuff too. So I can catch up on some shows and stuff. Yeah, there you go. Ted Lasso. Exactly. <laughs> I did. I watched all of Ted Lasso. Nice. I'm here. I'm there. I'm every F and where. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the flat ground app. Obviously, the, the traditional platform has helped a lot of big leaguers, and they haven't been shy about expressing that. They, they've been pretty gratuitous toward your work. Who was that first pitcher that credited you for helping them with a pitch? That is a great question. Um, I'm trying to think like publicly who would have been the first. I know Jake Diekman did with his slider. Alec Manoa did with his slider. Um, my favorite, literally my favorite, another interrupting dinner type thing with my wife was you Darvish DMing me about Shane Bieber's knuckle curve grip. And I'm getting this DM while I'm sitting at dinner again and my poor wife. Um but I'm like seeing my phone and she's like, get off your phone. I'm like, you Darvish is DMing me to find a grip for him. And I'm like, I got to do it. Like, it's one of those things like I have to do it right now. And I ended up getting him that, that information. He threw it the next day in a bullpen. It was like, I got it. I got it. He wanted to see the spin access and everything. And then ended up throwing in a game that he K'd a bunch of people. It might've been 12 or 13 K's. And his, he ended up converting the knuckle curve to his slider spin axis. He's like, I just didn't feel comfortable with the knuckle curve throwing it that way, but I can make my slider move that way because you Darvish is the most amazing guy in the world when it comes to that stuff, just like a savant when he comes, when it comes to that. And he credited me like in the, they asked him both on Twitter. And then in, I think in an interview afterwards, you know, what made your slider move that way? And he's like pitching ninja. I was like, wow, this is really cool. But those little things, make make everything i do worthwhile like this little awesome things um it's just so much fun 
you couldn't say, Hey, yeah, after I got you after dinner. And I, I, I understand you, you need the immediacy, the, uh, there's, there's a enthusiasm that needs to be attended to right away. Right. There is. And part of it is like, I, I do have this, the reason why Twitter is so good for me is like, I do have this little ADD. Like I like to communicate things very quickly, succinctly. The character limits are perfect for me. Um, the length of videos are perfect for me. It's just the way my, my head works. But also when someone contacts me, I like, I can't move on to something else until I finish doing that, what I needed to do for them. And it's just the, like, it's just the way my mind works. It works that way. And in business type stuff, it works that way in kind of everything. It's one reason why I'm always really responsive on stuff is because if I don't respond right away, I'm going to forget about it and I'm not going to do it. And I never want to be that guy. But there, there's just an authenticity to what you've done here. And I think that's why all the players have, have responded to you so, so much. I mean, you can't fake authenticity and you, from the start, you've had that and you still retain that to this day. And you know, where, where do you go from here? How big do you make this thing that you create, this monster that, that you created that everybody loves and recognizes is real and authentic? You know, uh, how do you maintain that? And, and where do you go next? That's a great, like, I don't ever have this master plan. I am like, you know, I started this pitchingninja.com thing because people want to know where to get, to get merch right away when rather than go to different sites and stuff. So that's one area that I'm growing, but really it's, I don't like, I don't have a plan. I just do what I want to do. I'm my own boss, which is awesome. Um, whatever I think helps the most people, but I still like every day I wake up and I love doing this. And I love when anybody responds to anything, um, especially I mean, major leaguers, but also helping anybody out. Like when I see a kid get signed because of this, it's, it's a, something that you can't replace with money. It just makes you feel good. And I guess that's it. It's like, it's like mostly I'm a hundred percent authentic because this is what I want to do. And it's so much fun. And I think, I, I mean, I'm lucky enough to talk to major league players. Like I meet them and they're like, I'm a big fan. I'm like, dude, you're the ones playing the game. I'm just a guy with a keyboard, but it's like, it's always so cool. Like that's crazy. Going to the all-star game and getting all these players to be like, like, hey, uh, I mean, Max Scherzer coming up to me saying, I'm a big fan of your stuff. I'm like, I didn't know you knew who I was. And now I don't know a question I'm going to ask you. It was great. Uh, How does that make you feel, though, when you have people at the stature of, of a Max Scherzer coming up to you, wanting to meet you, not the other way around? It's surreal. Like, that part is always really weird to me. Like, having somebody come up to me and say, like, I'm a, I'm a big, big fan, hoping to see you here. I'm so glad I got to meet, like, you know, again, they're the stars. I'm just helping showcase a little bit of what they do. And players are really, really, because the other thing I don't do, and, and, and I hope more and more people on social media can take the, the one thing I want to leave everybody with on social media is being nice. Like there's no reason to crap on folks. I don't, you don't, you'll rarely see me crap on anybody on, on Twitter, especially not a player, because I know how hard it is. The other thing is I think players want that. They want somebody who unconditionally likes, you know, they can bounce things off of that isn't on their team. That isn't a coach with their team and says, now don't worry about that. I mean, if you're a pitcher and trying out a new grip and your coach says, you don't, what are you going to, what are you going to throw this pitch for? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I think they get shut down and I am objective, but also not part of their team. I don't charge anything for this. It's just me loving doing this stuff. And I'm a sounding board. So I think players, I think pitchers, especially as a community, it's tough out there. I mean, Coney knows how tough it is. Like you have a crappy day and fans are all over you and you feel like crap and you you're miserable. I know what that's like, and I'm partly a psychologist or psychiatrist for these guys to bounce things off of and to let them know their stuff's good. I've, I've even DM pitchers after a start where they've had a tough start, and I know that they know how, you know, that they did it or they, they threw the right pitch, it got hit. And I'll just reassure them and say, hey, you know, that's, that's the game where I still know you're awesome. So, and if I can help them in a tiny bit, like get right back into that mindset, it's great. If they don't want to hear it, then they don't have to hear it. But I think most people like that. That's a great point because in today's game, probably one of the biggest changes I've seen in terms of instruction was 
a results-based instruction and a process-based instruction. And now, just like you said, hey, you did the right thing. You threw the right pitch. Sometimes you have to tip your cap to the other to the to the hitter. He had he had a good pitch. So, you know, I, I was consumed with whether I won or lost a game or what the results were. You know, back in the '80s. And now I I applaud the fact that you know that not only sabermetrics, analytics, really the whole movement in this direction has helped us quantify performance and, and, and sort of separate out, you know, the, uh, the, the real, the, what really happened and, and, and what you think should have happened. And, and I agree with you completely. That's what the players want. That's what we want. Unbiased, straight up information. And, you know, a, a lot of it is process based, you know, you're doing the right thing, keep doing the right thing. The reassurance that, that you just talked about. Totally. And the one thing that I think we lose sometimes and that with all the analytics, which is fantastic, like it's so cool to slice and dice things and to, and to know long-term I'm on the right track and this is the way to attack hitters and this is why this pitch works, but it's still a game played by humans. And I think we shortcut or we, we, we underrate the mental aspects of it. Like it's tough to go through this as anything at anything you do any, at any level being top of whatever you do, it's tough. And there are days where you feel like crap and there are days that like, we're not machines. And I think fantasy baseball turns this into, you know, this guy's stats or this is, and, and that's true. There's, there's salary caps. You're working with, you know, players and they're all about stats, but the players aren't only stats. The players are a person that is doing a bunch of different things. Sometimes you got it. Sometimes you don't. And that's why I also like to share mental game stuff is I think it's good to learn from other people like, what made Greg Maddox, Greg Maddox, what was his mental approach like on the bump as opposed to just the way his pitches moved. So I think it's, it's a, a, maybe a third of the game that is not at all talked about by sabermeticians. Um, the other thing, clubhouse, like you've been in winning clubhouses, you've been around on, on it, it, your job. You've been around people you didn't want to work with. You work better when you're with people you want to work with. So saying that there's a winning clubhouse, I know a lot of people that deal in stats are like, there's no such thing as that. There's a, there's a such thing as working in an environment where you're free to fail and feel to experiment, feel free to experiment and you're, you know, and people lift you up and then you perform better. Absolutely. freaking lutely because why would there be Harvard MBAs that, that just judge how businesses are, you know, structured in terms of personnel? And, and, and inner team personalities. So why doesn't that take place in baseball? Clearly it takes place in baseball and we shortcut that a lot of times. So I think that's a, that's something that I like to do as a person to help players have that positive support because I like to see them perform at their best. All right, as we wrap it up, we told you earlier when we had Josiah ask you the question, we end our interview with you by giving you a chance to ask a question to a future guest here on Toe in the Slab. So without further ado, you have a chance to uh, ask a question to our very first reliever that's going to be popping on Toe in the Slab, and it is the three-time All-Star closer of the Milwaukee Brewers, Josh Hader. So you can ask Josh anything you want. What do you have for him? That is a great question. I, I think number no, you're one, supposed what, to offer that up. I know. <laughs> so like I uh, like, I, but the great question is, what do I ask him? I want to know, like, kind of when he realized that his fastball was as unhittable as it is. Was it mostly? Was there, there any analytics based on that? Was it hitter based off hitters? And what does he think makes that special in his own mind? Like, how is he able to get his fastball to? Uh, get on a plane to miss so many, to miss so many bats. I know, is it, is it the, the arms and legs and the weird, you know, kind of the weird arm slot. Is there a special trick that he does with his hand to try to get a little bit of rise on the ball? What is it? Like, I want to know what the key to that is. Perfect. I think that sums up Josh Hader in a nutshell right there. There's a lot of moving body parts, but it's all unique because and specific to him. I think he maximizes the most out of his, uh, his God-given ability. So looking forward to talking with Josh. We'll definitely have that question relayed to him. Rob, this has been terrific. Great talking to you. Uh, best of luck in the 2022 season. Best of luck on the rest of your off-season drills at your keyboard and uh, get all that conditioning up to par whenever we start this season on time. Thank you very much, man. 
And, and thanks for having me. You guys are doing a great job and I've been watching. So uh, I love, give me more pitching specific content. This is awesome. Keep it up guys. Uh, we're fans of you too. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks guys. I thought it was pretty interesting that Rob has gathered and, and purchased all this technology and obviously he has a son who could probably benefit from it as well, but he kind of just buys it to try it out. Like it, is, is it a rap soda, a, a tax write-off is, is that how it works for, for pitching ninja? I don't know. Should be. You're right. That's a great point. Needs, needs an accountant, right? You got to get a tax guy for the ninja. I'm sure. I'm sure he's covered down there. You know, the motivating part for him, obviously is his son. His son's a pitcher at Georgia tech and he, he tried to educate himself as his son was coming up through the amateur ranks and trying to get to the next level. And uh, you know, that, that to me, that's motivation. You got a son who's a pretty good pitcher and he's going to pitch on a D one college program. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be doing everything I could too for, for my son. Yeah. This is next level work by a father, in my opinion, because I, I see some of these stories about parents with players, not just in baseball with a lot of sports, but with baseball, we are most familiar with it. And we hear the stories of just how expensive certain showcases are and going that route. It has to be so daunting as a parent, because you want what's best for your kid, obviously your child comes first and Rob literally took it to another level here with, uh, with his flat ground app and with everything that he's doing with, with pitching Ninja, very, very impressive. Cause this is just a, a he was a lawyer. He still is a lawyer, but he just wanted to learn more. And it speaks a lot to Rob because what did he do when he wanted to learn more? He literally ingratiated himself into getting the knowledge firsthand, putting in the work. And this right now, what you see on Twitter and stuff like that, it's the fruit of a guy's labor. So it's really impressive, highly respectable. And uh, Rob was great here coming on toe in the slab. All right. This week in pitching history, James, what do you have for us as we turn the calendar over to February? All right, fellas. Uh, two things. Um, February 2nd, 1936. So that's 86 years ago, Wednesday. The first Hall of Fame class. Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Honus Wagner, and two pitchers, Christy Matthewson and Walter Johnson. Inaugural class, that's the five, and the rest is history. Want to get into a, something a little, uh, something else too. So February 4th, 1956, that's 66 years ago on Friday. The Cy Young Award is established. Coney, your award. So the award goes to the best pitcher of the year in each league, as we know. Uh, so in 1955, Commissioner Ford Frick felt that pitchers weren't really getting enough love in MVP voting. So we wanted to make a pitching award. And there was actually a little bit of, uh, of, of controversy around it because then is this something that's going to take away from pitchers getting MVP consideration? It was really meant to, to kind of lift pitchers up and be side by side as position players kept getting MVP. So there was a, there was a, uh, some resistance to it, but in November, 1955, Cy Young died. So Frick made his pitching award, the Cy Young Memorial Award. So nobody could really argue with it now. So they make the award. Back then, it was only one pitcher for all of Major League Baseball. And the first winner was Don Newcomb in 1956. And then by the time we get to 1967, then it cleaves off into an American League Cy Young and a National League Cy Young. And uh, our David Cohn won the American League Award in 1994. That's interesting that Frick, I guess, used it as a memorial award since the, you know, the passing of, of Cy Young, you wonder if there was enough pushback from, like you said, James, there was a lot of, you know, there was some pushback that the award would take the attention away from other awards. Like if Cy Young doesn't pass away in 1955 or at in that time when this is being discussed, is the award in existence? Does it come years later or do, what do they do in 1955? That's what I was thinking while you were, while you were explaining how, everything fell into place in the timeline. Yeah, it is, a, it is a little odd. And it makes you think, well, would, would the award have come later? What would have happened if they established a pitching award sooner? You know, we, you know, okay, you know, Greg Maddox has all these Cy Youngs and Jim Palmer has all these Cy Youngs. Well, what if the award was around in the 30s or the 40s or earlier than that? How many Cy Youngs would Cy Young have? 
Yeah. How many yeah. Cy Youngs would Lefty Grove have? Or Robin Bob Feller. Feller. Yeah. yeah. Bob Feller. All, so all of them. It, yeah. It's it's interesting to see how the, the award came around. And then now, uh, now I think pitchers should get, you know, if you win the, the Cy Young, you could get, you could get MVP too. We've seen it occasionally, but I think maybe it should happen more often. Pitchers, and we've had these kinds of discussions, pitchers face sometimes face more batters during a season than batters have plate appearances, you know, as a full-time player. So if a pitcher has that kind of impact pitching every fifth day, they have more impact on a given game than a position player does. It kind of all evens out. Credit where credit is due, right? Well, that's why we, 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 we wear that statement out a lot. At least I do. And there are occasions when a pitcher has that dominant of a season where he helps his team win more games than it needs to be acknowledged. So yeah, I, I think it's more rare, uh, certainly uh, you know, position players play every day, obviously, but there are seasons where, you know, pitchers, you know, can jump up there and have a 10 war, you know, nine or a 10 war season wins above replacement. They, you know, when they get up in that category and you're that dominant, let me tell you something, Dwight Gooden's great year back in 1985, I guess it was, he, he was the MVP. He was the best player in the game that year, without a doubt. Just a monster year. One of the, mo- the biggest monster years of all time. Dwight Gooden's 1985 season. Go back and look at those numbers. Look look at slice it and dice it any way you want. He's the best player in the game in 1985. Shohei Otani named the cover boy of MLB The Show 2022. That was a big announcement coming up on, on Monday, this past Monday. We we're actually recording on the day that it happens. But uh, yeah, Shohei Otani, cover of GQ, cover of a video game. Who knows what's next? We'll see what happens. Uh, but that was the logical choice. There was a lot of big buildup with that video game cover. And my whole, you know, the whole time watching every ad, I'm saying to myself, is there really any doubt here? I mean, who who would you have it on? Obviously, it's going to be Shoei Otani. But uh, we have made official today. Uh, all right, guys. Three up, three down. Each of us gives one storyline around baseball that we believe deserves some extra light shed on it. Hall of Fame announcement, James, announced over the last week or so. And I know you have some thoughts on three up, three down with Cooperstown. Yeah, just real quick, you know, some props to uh, to David Ortiz being the lone player uh, elected by the baseball writers uh, last week. Um, definitely one of the most uh, prolific, fearsome hitters uh, of his generation. Uh, well-deserved honor there. Um do because this is a pitching podcast. I want to highlight uh, a pitcher that I think has uh, been struggling to get his just due, but he is climbing uh, every year. Billy Wagner, uh, one of the most dominant uh, relievers, uh, pitch for pitch in baseball history, seven time All Star, sixth all time with 422 saves. Out of all pitchers with 800 or more innings in their career, he has the highest strikeout percentage, just over 33%, the best K per nine, almost 12 and a 187 opponent batting average, all best all time with that innings minimum. And uh, he's been ticking up slowly, but surely Uh, he's just got over 50. He got 51% uh, this year, his seventh on the ballot. So I'm hoping he he makes the jump. If not next year, maybe the year after that. And we can get a, uh, I believe a deserving uh, reliever into the hall of fame in Billy Wagner. Yeah. He's got the back half of his, of his, time on the ballot here coming up but if you have over 50 percent of the vote you're in good shape in my opinion i think there's still enough time for it for him to be elected I got one guy to back. throw on there on the other end excuse me excuse me for interrupting one guy on the other end of that who falls off the ballot with less than five percent of the vote carlos delgado carlos yeah. delgado his triple slash line 280, 383, 546 for a career, 929 OPS. Can I get 5% of the vote to stay on? I mean, the, it's a pretty, pretty good player, Carlos. There's always a player like that on the bottom end. I think he, he's the guy I wanted to shine the light on in, in terms of, uh, oh, wow, 2.9% of the vote, Carlos Delgado? You look at his numbers and Big Poppy's numbers, they aren't that far, far apart. You know, Big Poppy got more home runs, but wow, that's, that's a pretty good career. Carlos Delgado had 473 career home runs how hard it is and also how much there is a need possibly for re-examination of just of continue the discussion a little bit yeah. 2.9 but you know three under three percent of the vote for carlos delgado mm-hmm. like if we if we still had the voting rules where players spend 15 years on the ballot and you have 
again, Billy Wagner's case right now, he's going into the halfway point of his time on the ballot. You're like, okay, yeah, he's, he's going to, the way everything's trajecting, he's, he's going to be a no problem, but yeah, Carlos Delgado, that's that that's at least continue the discussion, right? Yeah, that's going to warrant more examination thought. on the veterans committee for sure. All right. Three up three down here. And this is something that we were talking about a little bit earlier with the CBA discussions and the ramifications of the lockout. I guess you could call it repercussions of the lockout here because we have a new low to these lockout rules that kind of state that teams and players cannot be in contact with one another. So we have Adam Wainwright, who has a fundraising event happening next weekend just outside of St. Louis. It's part of his big league impact foundation and former Cardinals closer, Jason Azeringhausen. He's, A local guy, he grew up on the Illinois side of the St. Louis greater metro area. He was set to attend and sign autographs at this event for Wainwright. But because Jason Isringhausen is technically a Cardinals employee, he's unable to attend with the lockout in place. And and Isringhausen works with Cardinals alum. It's not like he is a special assistant to the GM or even in a deeper role in the Cardinals front office. Wainwright tweeted, let me bring it up here. Wainwright tweeted out. He said, quote, unfortunately, this is true. We thank Jason for trying. Seems silly to me. I guess they thought we were going to try and negotiate a bargaining agreement at our charity event where the money raised will feed people and provide clean water. Is he's a stud, these rules. And he had the thumbs down emoji. And we had Adam on. He has a great sense of humor, a great personality. So you can kind of understand the tone that that tweet was written in but because and Isringhausen is an ambassador for the St. Louis Cardinals you can't attend a charity event that has nothing to do with the CBA negotiations I I really tried to avoid throwing Blake and statements on topics here but this is dumb it's dumb there is absolutely zero logic behind this it is dumb you're letting a fake rule get in the way of a really good cause here Yes, uh, you know, it, it is like they're trading state secrets, right? I mean, it, it is kind of comical. It, obviously, this is a strategy on the Major League Baseball side of things. You know, Commissioner Manfred is a labor lawyer by trade. He's an expert negotiator. He's been part of the negotiations for CBAs for years, even going back to the strike in the mid-90s. I dealt with him as, as taken over as one of the lead negotiators back then. So it's a calculated response on their part. The players did not want to lock out. The players association would have loved to continue talking, having meetings throughout the whole off season. They didn't want to be locked out. They certainly weren't threatening to strike or anything like that. And this was part of the owner's strategy. And Rob Manfred, the commissioner even said so. The reason they locked out the players was to create an atmosphere that they thought was beneficial to them to get a deal, to get an agreement. And this would, this goes along those lines. They think that, you know, that, that it's part of their strategy to, to have this sort of a rule where you have, you know, no pictures of the players on the 40 man rosters, no interaction between anybody on the 40 man roster and coaches or anybody in management. So this was not a player's association asking for this. This was, was not the player's association demanding this. This was part of the, the strategy of the, of the Major League Baseball player owners, part of the strategy of Commissioner Rob Manfred, that he thought this would enhance their, their chances to get an agreement. Um, I personally think it's a swing and a miss. I mean, we could take all kinds of pot shots we want at this particular, you know, it seems kind of foolish, right? Kind of, kind of senseless, but, you know, based on their calculations, they think it's, it's valuable. That's why, they, that's why the Major League Baseball owners and Rob Manfred decided to try to do this. And I'm not sure it's helped anything I mean, other than just – Leave yourself open to ridicule and have us talk about it, right? Talk about these kind of stories. The Adam Wainwright and, and Izzy story, Jason Isringhausen. I mean, it, it seems kind of senseless. So you're, you're leaving yourself open for, for ridicule in my mind. Yeah, complete open of the door for, like you said, ridicule and just deserve criticism that you could kind of avoid. But, hey, it's right there for the taking. And I think when it also starts to deal with charities, and fundraising ventures like that, I think that is a problem. I think you could you know, try and make special rules in that case, because like we've said, this, you know, there, there are certain legalities that don't apply to what's happening in terms of this 
break off between player and team communications. And this is, I think, one of those examples where you could possibly make an exception. So for, for the good of Adam Wainwright's fundraiser and Jason Isringhausen mingling with fans and being able to sign some autographs and stuff like that, please let's end the lockout already. Um, all right, guys, this was fun this week. Want to give a big shout out, big thanks to Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja for coming on and joining us here. Thanks again to our terrific producer, Dan Work, always doing a fine job. Rate, review, subscribe, please. It's the best way to support the show. New episodes drop each and every Tuesday here on Telling the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn. It is a production of John Boy Media. We will talk to you next week, everybody. Have a good one. Take care.